and we base this on security threats to our uh, systems in our businesses and offices and organizations. We all have uh, databases, and we all have uh, extensive uh, private information uh, that we store about our customers and clients. So this is a great opportunity to hear from a couple of experts. Uh, Brad Alvaro is the CEO of Phase 2. Uh, I will talk to you uh, probably in layman's terms, hopefully for my sake anyway, about the aspects, the technical aspects of, of securing your, your information. And then even equally as important as that is the insurance piece of that, which is now coming to the forefront given all the breaches that take place in small, medium, and large companies and organizations. So with that, enjoy your lunch. Thank you both to Brett and Terry for providing lunch and for doing this for us. We've got a repeat of this this evening at 5.30. Um, and then we're talking about continuing the series again in November. So we'll stay posted. We'll have information out there for you on that. I want to thank Rob in the library. They co-teamed with us on this, which is great. This is what we're supposed to do. We appreciate it, and I hope we'll be doing that again, not only for this, but for some other projects as well. So thank you. Thank you very much for coming today. I do want to say thank you to the Calvert Library and to the Calvert Chamber for helping put this together. Uh, couldn't have done it without them. So thank you very much. Cybersecurity. So uh, as Bill said, um, today is going to be the first course that we do uh, discussing cybersecurity. So we're keeping the overview broad uh, and kind of covering the general topic of what cybersecurity is, how it pertains to small and medium businesses, and what you can do as a small and medium business owner to help safeguard yourself against potential attacks or risks. So I always like to start this presentation by asking you what cybersecurity means to you and what your definition of cybersecurity is. Um, would anyone like to pose a definition or answer? Secure sure. passwords. Secure passwords, OK. <laughs> Sorry. Secure information. All of your password OK. Yeah. Protected data. Good. Um, those are great answers. I think they're all kind of a portion of what cybersecurity is. The definition that we're going to use today is it's the body of technologies, processes, and procedures that we utilize to protect our networks, to protect our computer systems, and protect our digital data from access attack or uh, damage. When we hear about cybersecurity in the news, we hear about large corporations, most recently Sony and Microsoft, for example, or we hear about government agencies or financial institutions. Uh, so why and how does this apply to small businesses? Uh, the answer is actually extremely uh, concerning, and it's a growing trend in the country that small and medium businesses are being targeted by groups and by individuals uh, that are seeking to gain access to information. Uh, what we've seen is in 2014 alone, 269,000 small businesses reported that they were a victim of a cyber attack. Over $800 million in damages were done as a result of those attacks, and it resulted in over $20 million in lost revenue for small businesses. So the numbers are staggering, and the worst situation, or the worst fact is that these numbers have been growing year over year, and we project that over the course of the next decade, they're going to continue to grow. The reason they're looking at small and medium businesses is not for the individual payoff that they get by attacking small business. It's because they realize that small and medium businesses don't have the resources or the knowledge to adequately protect themselves. And it makes them easier targets. And while the payoff on an individual basis may not be that great, they realize that when they attack large numbers of companies, the payoff is massive. So what are the risks for small businesses? And what do they, what do these, the results of these attacks look like? First and foremost is data theft and leads that result in legal action. When a data theft occurs, especially in some of the niche industries, medical, for example, financial, uh, there is a lot of legal work that goes into correcting those notifications out to affected parties. Uh, case, uh, legal action, casework, court cases, these are all massive expenses for small businesses that any small business, including my own, would want to avoid. Financial theft. 
about tempering financial records, unauthorized access to corporate bank accounts, to retirement accounts. These are all possibilities under what we call the internal threat. And we'll get to the difference between internal threat and external threat shortly. And lastly, data corruption and tampering. Uh, falsifying documents. Virus is like the crypto locker virus that's been all over the news recently that hijack data or data deletion or accidental or even intentional removal. These all result in downtime for businesses, which, as many small businesses know, uh, greatly impacts your revenue stream. Because when you can't access your data, when you can't do your job, you lose money. And of course, as we we're discussing, uh, industry specific consequences. For example, healthcare has governing bodies like the HHS that oversee regulations and enforce regulations on those industries. So let's talk about what the threats look like. Um, there's two different main types of threats that we're classified. There's internal and there's external threats. Let's first look at internal threats. Internal threats are threats that come to your business from within inside, or doors that get open from the inside to your network. The first and foremost are employees. Employees are our greatest asset as a business, but they're also our biggest threat too. When we have a disgruntled or unhappy employee, they're a risk to our network. They may compromise data. They may share data out from our network uh, or otherwise misuse company resources. Additionally, if we have employees that are misusing company resources or misusing web resources, they're going to sites that they're not supposed to be or they're downloading programs that they're not supposed to download, uh, they can potentially compromise your network by bringing in viruses, malware, malware, etc. EYOD, or bring your own device. We bring computers, phones, thumb drives, or other media into our office, opening <coughs> the doors for whatever that media may have on it. I'll give you the example of a university that I worked for. We got a call one morning, uh, right around the start of the day from a professor. And he said, my computer's running really slow. I can't get anything done. Something's wrong with it. So we went up, took a look at it. We saw uh, you know, the key signs of virus activity on the computer. It was transferring large amounts of data out to the network. The computer was completely maxed out on resources, running slow, like the user said. Uh, and when we ran a virus scan, it came up with a virus. So we put in the machine, we had some more scans, came back clean, closed the case, and moved on. A few hours later, that same professor called. And he said, hey, you know, you cleaned up my computer, but now a few computers in my lab that uh, the students work in are doing the same thing. They're running really slow. Can you come take a look? And sure enough, they had the same virus in them, which we cleaned and removed. At the end of the day, there were over 18 systems infected. 24 hours later, at the end of the next day, there were over 240 campus wide. After extensive research and extensive investigation, uh, collaborating with the full university's IT department, uh, and several days of work, we were able to successfully stop the virus and identify the root cause. It ended up being a flash drive that the professor brought in, had a very, uh, very specialized, very uh, advanced virus on it. What that virus did was install a small partition or space on that drive with an actual operating, Linux operating system on it. That Linux operating system had uh, an application that had two main goals. One was to spread and replicate itself. So when it was plugged into a computer, it would create a little partition or a uh, sector on the hard drive outside of the Windows operating system that any virus, typical any virus, could not detect. Two is once it was installed, it would go to the Windows operating system and install its virus. And that's what we would see. It would transfer data uh, out to the network. It's basically copying all the files. Think of it as an early form of crypto without the uh, without the encryption. It would transfer all the data out of the network. Um, and additionally, it would detect if this virus wasn't installed. And it had a timer, it would wait three hours. So if the virus is gone, three hours later, it would install. And when it was, once it made it to a host computer, it would look for other thumb drives to be plugged in. This professor was handing out coursework to his, uh, to his staff, or to his uh, students, rather. So he put it on a computer, and the students brought their thumb drives up and copied it to theirs. And this copied the virus to that thumb drive as well. And as they moved throughout, this, uh, throughout the campus network, they spread that virus from the computer. So this is an example of how bringing the device can potentially compromise your network, albeit that being an extreme example. <laughs> guest wireless and guest network access. Many businesses have this. 
it's a way to allow your customers, especially if you're a big storefront or customer facing business, to have Wi Fi access, bring their device in, and access the internet. But these also potentially open up holes on their network. They allow that user, that person, or any applications or potential malware installed on their computer to scan the network and watch what's going on. Additionally, if, it's, if there's uh, some other issues, they can access files on the network or see data on the network. And lastly, uh, we can think of natural and man-made disasters as a cybersecurity threat. It's not your typical you know, direct attack or anything like that, but it is something that can compromise data safety and result in data destruction. So fire, tornadoes, sprinkler systems malfunctioning going on, all will destroy data in your lives. External threats. External threats are more what you think of when you think of a cybersecurity system and what it's supposed to prevent against. This is your classic hacker, someone sitting behind a computer trying to gain access to your system. These are your, uh, your viruses, your malware, uh, your phishing sites that try to uh, get your password, gain access to your system. Uh, they're your bots that roll and scroll and try to find vulnerabilities in your network. They look for things like uh, open remote desktop ports or open SSH ports or other things that they can then get into your network with. So how do we stop this as a small and medium business, or how do we take appropriate safeguards to prevent such attacks? There's two main ways. One is through proper policies and procedures. The other is through utilizing appropriate software and hardware resources to prevent against attacks. So let's first look at the proper policies and procedures end. New and terminated employee policies and procedures. When we hire a new employee, we're hiring that employee to perform a role. Whether that be a billing staff member, a bookkeeper, an accountant, uh, administrative assistant, what be you. Uh, that person in our job, when we think about their role, has something specific that they do on a day to day basis. Equally so, they have a specific role in your computer network. They should have access to specific files, they should have access to specific shared resources, and they should have specific permissions on, your, on that computer and network. When we set up users, we want to ensure that we're setting them up, just like we would in their role in the office. Uh, granting them a restricted user account, uh, not giving administrative privileges unless they absolutely need it. Uh, defining precise permissions to what they should be accessing, as far as files on the network. You know, isolating administrative content to the administrative staff and keeping the other users out of that. Uh, having proper policies for your staff and making sure that they're aware of those policies. So password sharing is a common one. Uh, a lot of employees will share the password with another employee who performs a similar role. It's important to make sure that your users are uh, keeping their password to themselves. Uh, when they share it, it's hard to track exactly who's doing what on the network because then if John and Sally have the same have each other's account information, we don't know whether John or Sally is doing something on the network. Uh, data location and protection. It's important to know where the data is on the network. For most of you, this is a server or a storage device sitting on your network. Having that behind a locked door with a restricted user list, uh, cutting off access to people who shouldn't be able to get in there, the rest of the staff, for example, or cleaning staff, or other people that may have access to the building that are working. Remote work policies. Restricting remote access to your system, to the users who actually utilize and need it, and keeping track of who actually has that access. And then logging, making sure that your computers, servers, and network equipment is keeping track of what's happening on your network and keeping those logs. That's an especially important, uh, important aspect in the network. And then, of course, employee termination policies and processes. No one likes firing or letting an employee go, whether that's a result of employee action or just the business changing. Uh, it's always a uh, hard process to go through. And we always have to look at this process as if the person is going to have malicious attempts afterwards. 99% of the time, they won't. But, for the sake of cybersecurity, we always look as if they will. So having a proper policy and procedure in place for when employees have been terminated is important as well. Removing their system access, making sure that their passwords have been cut, their accounts have been suspended or deleted, and making sure that their remote access and access to data has been transferred to the replacing party or to another party that's going to be assuming the roles. And making sure that our timeline is perfect for this as well. Best practice is to cut the access just prior to termination of that employee. That way, when that employee goes back to clear out their desk or they go home and have remote access to your system, they can no longer get in. Uh, 
that access has already been cut and you're confident that that procedure's been executed. Vacation time and audits. Uh, many businesses don't look at vacation time as a cybersecurity tool, as a cybersecurity tool, excuse me. And it's not a common thing to think of. But vacation time is a great time to review the uh, performance and actions of your employees while they're out of the office. When someone leaves for an extended period of time, whether it be vacation or some other form of extended leave, someone has to fill their shoes and take over that role. When they're doing that, they're not as familiar as the person that takes and performs those actions on a daily basis. So they're going to ask questions, they're going to look into things a bit further. It's a great time to perform a natural audit and kind of just check out what has been happening uh, in that position by that employee. Uh, encourage those questions, encourage those reviews. And if something doesn't seem right, don't be afraid to look into it. We're not saying be paranoid of your employees, but we're saying take the time to do your due diligence. It's one of those ounce of preventions to come to Equally so, perform frequent on this. We're not saying daily monitor your computers, monitor logs, go through all that. We understand it's a huge administrative burden. But once a month or once a quarter, take the time to review your computer use and see what people are doing on the network. Like we said, firewalls do a great job of recording who can access what is on the network. Um, monitor those logs, see what people are doing on the network, and see if anything suspicious is coming in. Additionally, uh, perform routine reviews of your infrastructure. Monitor your user accounts. Make sure that any employee that's been turned over like it isn't actually there as a user. Uh, check their permissions and access levels and see who's accessing files. And make sure that people are aligned appropriately with the issue. <coughs> Hardware and software protections. First and foremost, having a proper firewall, threat detection, and antivirus are the core components of preventing any sort of cybersecurity attack or potential vulnerability. Think of your firewall as your gatekeeper to your office. It monitors the traffic on a daily basis, what's coming in and going out of your network. It keeps track of uh, the content that your, viewers, uh, that your employees are utilizing and what they're downloading. Uh, it monitors for potential threats and makes the attempt to block them. It's important to keep your firewall up to date as well. Um, we recommend systems like Rocky, FireEye, Palo Alto networks. These appliances uh, go beyond the measures of a traditional firewall. They have uh, threat detection protocols in them. They have automatic suspension of those threats. And additionally, they have advanced content filtering. Uh, content filtering allows you to say, you know, my employees should be able to get to the network. They should be able to access a set number of resources. But I don't need them on social media. Let's exclude them. And you can actually exclude, at a global level, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, other social media sites that you don't want them on. Or you can uh, restrict uh, pornographic sites, violent sites, any type of content that you don't want your users to access. These are great tools as a business. Uh, whether you have an IT team uh, or you're handling this internally or on your own, uh, these three appliances are fairly user friendly. They're very easy to use. Um, Meraki is probably the easiest. FireEye and Palo Alto are a little more complex to utilize. You may want to consult with an uh, MIT specialist to set one of these up. Uh, additionally, these three devices have automatic update features. So the updates to the firewall itself, to threat detection measures, etc., can be updated automatically for you. I think it's going to alleviate some of that administrative burden. Antivirus is your backup. Once some a threat is made it through, your firewall. It's going, it's destined for a computer, a network device, or your server. Antivirus monitors those. It's your second line of defense. Antivirus scans what's on your computers as well as keeps an eye on what's trying to install or trying to run on your computer and what act to um, suspend or delete those threats. Uh, we recommend a system called Panda Cloud Office Protection. It is a system that has a cloud based controller, meaning you can manage the system and manage your computers from a cloud web interface that you can access from anywhere. The nice part about this system is it also has a cloud virus definition database. And unlike traditional antivirus applications, those updates don't push out once a day. They don't push out when you choose to push them out. They're continual. And as new virus definitions become available, the machines get them every few minutes. The nice part about a system like that is it prevents or helps reduce the effect of what's called zero day activity. Uh, has anyone heard that term before? <coughs> zero day activity. So, zero day activity is 
a virus or threat that has been uh, produced but not identified, uh, not identified by an antivirus maker or by a software developer yet. Uh, when those occur, it's because the time that's elapsed is usually pretty short. Um, eventually, the antivirus maker or the software developer flags this and notifies the antivirus maker that we have this vulnerability, it's patched and fixed. But there's that time gap between when that actually happens. Um, this reduces that time frame since the updates are pushing out much quicker. Another way to address that, and an optional me um, method of protection if your budget allows, is what's called adaptive defense. Uh, this is not unique to Panda. There are other systems, Norton, uh, FireEye, Palo Alto, all put out systems for this as well. Adaptive defense is a program or application that works in tandem with your antivirus and your firewall. What it does is it monitors trends in your network and on your computers. It makes a baseline of what your users are doing on the network, what your daily activity looks like. And then it looks for things that are atypical or different. And it flags them. And it will suspend that activity and then send an alert off saying, hey, this wasn't this wasn't normal. It didn't fit with what you normally do. I blocked it. It's a very nice system if your budget allows for adding an extra layer of protection. And again, in healthcare, financial, or any industries where you're handling sensitive information, these are great tools to have at your disposal. Utilizing Active Directory. Uh, kind of going back to the policies and management of things. Active Directory is a system that runs on your core server. Uh, this system allows you to regulate user accounts, regulate the computers that are on your network to prove and allow them access to certain resources. Uh, but additionally, it allows you to set certain security measures as well. Password complexity and expiration, for example. You can restrict users and say, your password has to meet these security requirements. It must be eight characters, have a number, letter, or special character, or symbol in that password. You can also say that once every 90 days, or once every six months, or a time period you're choosing, that password expires and must be changed. You can also do things to safeguard uh, from other potential internal threats, such as screen timeouts, meaning uh, when a user walks away or they leave for the day, but they forgot to log out of their computer, you can institute policies that will automatically lock that screen. That prevents against other departments or other employees seeing that screen or other people who have access to the building, the building they're cleaning here, for example. The server and this system also allows you to regulate and dictate file access. You can set up the permissions in this system for who has access to what files, what files are shared with what users or what departments in the company. It's a great tool for kind of mitigating a lot of potential risks for openings in the network. Implementing proper networks. Isolating public and private networks is important. We gave the example earlier of wireless networks being a potential vulnerability. These can easily be mitigated, and we of course encourage all businesses to have a, a, a public, publicly available wireless connection. It gives you that ability to give your customers access to the internet, utilize that while you're waiting, while you're taking care of them, or allow them to collaborate and interact with you. Uh, they should be isolated, whether that's a physical <coughs> separation or a virtual, such as a VLAN separation, that isolates them from the rest of your network. Uh, isolating voice and data. Most phone systems now are modernized. They run over the internet after they run over your standard network. Uh, isolating that traffic is a good idea, not just for a quality of service standpoint, but also for protection. A lot of the new voice systems and phone systems out there have a server, just like your IT infrastructure does. Uh, they have a voice mailbox or something like that that has to be activity. And we isolate those for mitigating other potential risks. And it's good to think about this not just in the terms of phones and the public and private network, but take into consideration the other aspects of what touches your network. So camera systems, for example, security systems, et cetera. Isolating that traffic is a good way to mitigate some of your risk. And this is something that an IT professional can help you out there. Implementing proper backups. Uh, backups are your, are your lifeline in the event of uh, a breach or a compromise. Uh, when data is deleted, this is your way to restore that data. When we look at backups, we look at three main aspects. The first is having a local backup, a backup there in your office. This allows for quick restore in the event of accidental file deletion or even intentional file deletion. Uh, a remote backup gives you an extra layer of protection. Say the office, you know, there is a fire or there is a flood or something happens to the data in your office. We then have a remote backup we can call, uh, call back on and pull that data from. 
So make sure that when you set up your backup system, you're working with your IT provider, that you have an alternative backup that's physically separate or physically distant from your current backup solution that's in house. And then encryption of backups. If your system is compromised or otherwise uh, penetrated, making sure that you have the backup encryption can be a lifesaver, uh, or encryption on your backup can be a lifesaver. When users come in, or when an individual or group comes in who's trying to compromise your data, having the data encrypted prevents, helps prevent some of that tampering of data. It prevents them from encrypting a program, for example, cryptolocogram of files, et cetera. I'll give you the example of a local municipality out of Pennsylvania that contacted us recently. Uh, they found out about us through some local municipalities that we support. And they called and said that they unfortunately got the crypto locker virus, and their police department, uh, all of their files were encrypted. They had the ransom notes saying they had to pay the, uh, basically pay the people that stole their data uh, to get it back. And they said, is there anything you can do to help us? With, and uh, you know, can, you, can you take a look at this for us? And we said, sure. And our first question was, well, do you have backup? And they said, we, we think we do, but we don't know. And upon further investigation, we took a look at their system. It looks like they had a backup system that was trying to run, but unfortunately it was failing. And additionally, the backup wasn't encrypted. So CryptoLocker encrypted for them uh, the data that they did have. And unfortunately, a police department had to pay the people who stole their data to get back. How did they not like, you can I still don't understand how they get caught. When they paid on it, it was through an anonymous source. They dumped it to probably a PayPal account or something like that. They paid tracers with an offshore bank account. Wow. Yeah, that's it. Crypto Locker is pretty common right now. And, uh, when you, if you are infected with that, the one thing it does is it puts some text in the side every single file saying we've encrypted your files. You need to email this address to get your data back, and they respond and tell you where you can it. Mm -hmm. When we look to the future, IT trends are constantly changing. Uh, keeping ahead of those trends and keeping an eye on as trends evolve and change is always a great idea because that's how you can prevent and mitigate some of those potential events in the future. Keeping your systems up to date, Windows patches, security updates, and don't forget about your firewall and your security appliances on your network, keeping those up to date. Be mindful of your staff. Again, don't be paranoid, but be mindful of what they're doing. Perform those frequent audits. Work with an IT service provider. That's what we're here for, is to help you. We know that the administrative burden and the time that goes into this can be intensive. We're here to help you with that. No system is impenetrable. No, no system is unhackable. The government will tell you that. Some people especially tell you that. Uh, but there's steps, even as a small and medium business, that you can do to put the necessary safeguards in place to help prevent and mitigate the potential of a cybersecurity attack. So thank you very much for your time. We're going to hold questions until uh, after Carrie's presentation. I'm going to have, invite her up now to talk about if you are a victim of a cybersecurity attack, what safeguards and insurance uh, you should have in place to help mitigate those situations. The main question of after 45, where are my glasses, right? <laughs> <laughs> So we need a break, stretch your legs, or use the restroom real quick. It's no big deal if we we're just keep on going. Keep on going. Okay. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you for coming today. Um, been talking to Bill about hosting something for quite a while, so I'm glad it finally put into fruition. And as you can see, my binder has gotten bigger and bigger with different companies that I've worked with and endorsements and and um, different case studies. So my name is Carrie Polk. I'm a nationwide agent um, and also a broker. I've been in business since 1996. So um, recently just got my commercial lines coverage specialist designation. So I feel I am giving a lot more um, advisement to my commercial clients. So I'm glad this could be one more topic to discuss. What is cyber liability insurance? Um, it's going to mean different things to different people, unfortunately. It can be very confusing to navigate. But the main definition of liability is being negligent, finding out that you may have done something, um, you're legal liable, and then 
also being sued. So obviously when there is some kind of attack on your system and your customer's information has been compromised, they're gonna to look to you to um, get those answers. So not all companies face the same cyber, cyber liability risks. Um, there is no one size fits all. So a lot of different endorsements. I think companies do a great job managing their tangible risks, property, their building, for fires and flood, but it's intangible data, I think that people just get very overwhelmed in and how do you um, protect that? And again, you may have an IT people on the back end, but there's still some things that can happen. So the main thing for cyber insurance is to protect your business, your customers, and protect your reputation. Um, so we talked about care custody and control. So again, you're liable when that information that you're holding for your customers, your donors, um, once it's out of your care custody control um, and something happens to it, that's when I know Brett was talking about is when you're at risk. People do not realize that 47 states have violations and sanctions um, for when you are misusing your client's um, information or your system was hacked. So I actually included a little bit of the Maryland law here um, and what a table would look like. But if at the end of, we're gonna have a survey at the end, so if you want some of these links that I'm gonna share with you, please let me know, and I'll make sure I do that for you. Because if you work, one of my loss examples is if you are working with clients in different states, then each state is gonna have its own sanctions and penalties and fines. So that's something to be aware of. So Maryland, um, CA, when it talks about personal information definition, the CA, um, stands for uh, customer account information, that's driver's license numbers, social security numbers, credit card numbers, so any personal information. It also could be as broad as the health um, information as well. So again, what, what does a breach have to be notified? The very last tab talks about uh, what parties have to be notified. So you must notify the Office of the Attorney General uh, once the uh, individuals have raised at least a thousand persons and then you have to notify consumer reporting agencies. So there is definitely um, some help for you if you have the proper insurance once you know there is a breach um, to go forward. Now let's talk about some claims examples. A broker broke into accountant's office stole a computer of 800 clients. The client's accounts were in the four states and obviously needing assistance this cost $280,000. Okay. Another example are burglary. Laptop containing medical records, social security numbers, 5,500 patients in Texas, a medical clinic. Um, then you have insider theft, which is your employee. So over a year period, two nurses' aides um, filing fraudulent tax returns for 3,700 people. Now we have an external hack. So a computer of a small accounting firm in Connecticut these used to like 900 clients containing tax records. Then you have loss, a lost laptop. Um, now you have a data breach from your customers, now you require an investigation, notification, and credit monitoring, which you are required to do. Patient health lost information, regulatory fines. Now you have Visa MasterCard fines from credit, credit card processing and encrypted point of sale system. Class action lawsuits, do you defend, policy response. One great resource I have is a data breach calculator. Um, I can play with this for 15, 20 minutes and I'm just amazed the range of costs that we see. So I have the ability to go in on how many accounts that may be infected. So I can give you guys a scenario on how many clients you service. What kind of breach, what kind of data was was, was breached with their social security, credit card, personal information. And believe me, all those three um, tabs are gonna, gonna uh, create different amounts. Now you have asking if your data is centralized, um, is fraud already expected, is there now a compliance issue, and possibly can there be a federal class action lawsuit. So depending on what you hit, this incident here is well over a million dollars. Cost per record, $4,000. So 
So um, different things I saw as low as $200, um, and then I've seen some as almost $3 million. Brett talked about the um, cyber attacks. Um, small businesses, 50%. Um, small businesses are again preyed upon by criminals because they were low bearing fruit. Um, now a lot of um, cyber liability insurance is mandated by business vendor contracts. So as an insurance agent, I have to look at certificates of insurance all the time. And I know a lot of you guys as business owners are eager to take jobs, but once I see these agreements, I start to tell my client what actually you need. Before you know it, I have to send you a bill for a few hundred bucks or a few thousand dollars. You had no idea it was going to cost that much because that wasn't in your in your in, in your budget in um, in your proposal. Six percent of businesses go out of business after a breach. Um, again, clients are pretty much hoping you're going to trust their business um, and trust their information. That doesn't always happen. So insurance is going to prepare you for, for these kinds of um, breaches. Now we have objections, okay? Um, you have coverage. Your general liability is not going to cover you for this. This is a specific endorsement that you will need. Um, if your policy does have it, maybe nominal $50,000, okay? So it's really up to you. I don't store data. Everyone that collects data is a risk, whether it's paper, whether it's in computer, Again, just storing anyone's information is um, you have a compliance obligation. Your um, POS device is encrypted. The certain types of malware systems still have issues. So a lot of people think, well, I have those safety issues or you're still gonna have some issues. You're too small. Um, you don't feel like you're gonna be a target. Well, again, statistics show that 50%, um, because of the being less sophistication for the businesses, are easily targeted. Too expensive. Um, it's a big assumption I hear, but until you actually get a quote, um, policies go as low as 250 to about $1,800. So that's a small price to pay for um, investment. What is insurance going to cover? Um, you have your first, part, first party expenses and your third party expenses. So you have your data, you have your network interruption, cyber extortion, um, forensic investigation, public relations, we talk about your reputation, legal services. Um, you're not going to probably find somebody doing a pro bono for you for this. Um, incident notification, credit monitoring services. Then you have legal liability, regulatory fines, penalties, and MasterCard Visa and American Express fines. So these are all things that your insurance would cover. Brett talked about your employees. Um, you know, again, it's just not a matter of if it has happened. It's, it's, it's a matter of when your, your loss is stolen. But again, talking about the training program, what do you have in place for, for your business? And again, if your employees are in violation of, um, of your program, then definitely what is um, the remediation for you? I actually was able to go to the Federal Communications Commission, and you can actually get a profile and actually develop a side this small business planner for you when you first staff. I mean, look at this thing. It's over, I think it's like 75 pages. But it just gives you some really hot topics to think about um, and work with your IT company on how you can make your, your business safer. So what should your cyber policy look like? Again, it's gonna look different things to every different company. Um, and it's different because the few companies um, that I work with have different names, um, different endorsement names. So um, you really have to look at what your agency is, what your business is gonna need for you. And obviously, there's a challenge of predicting, engaging how big or small your breach may be. So again, I give somebody, you know, you have, you know, giving you a price for 250 clients being effective, but maybe we had now you have a thousand, so that price is going to be different. Um, again, there's no coverage under your general liability or client coverage. This is specific. And like you said, coverages will change from insurer to insurer. Homeland Security has now even officially divorced that they are just perplexed. And this is something that is overlooked. Government assistance, think it's gonna happen? Yeah. It's not. Um, obviously, they're overwhelmed with the perils of fires, tornadoes, natural disasters. They are not going to help you um, when this seems to come around for you guys. So, do you consider this an expense or an investment for your business? 
Um, companies, again, they're more secure when you can show your vendors that you have this protection. Um, you might need to get some more bigger contracts and you have your customer's trust. Um, vendor contractual requirements and obviously consequences. I could show you a lot more loss examples. Um, <coughs> some could be as little $200 uh, or at least plus a record. So coordinate with your IT company. They really know the risks. And obviously contact your current, current insurance company. Um, if you're a nationwide client, we have an endorsement. Um, we, I know travelers may have an endorsement. I think USLI, so really depending what your, what your company is offering. But your insurance advisor should be talking about this. I know everyone's so quick to go to the 800 number for all different things, but they're not advising you. On, they don't know your business, so it really makes a difference. So again, $1,800 or up to $229. I'm not going to go over all these things, but you know, again, if you want some of these links, I can give them to you. Um, if you, I mean, if you just Google cyber liability or, or cyber attacks, it's amazing what can happen. So again, you have the breach guides, training guides, incident response plan, um, the mini calculators. Um, I have, a, I've got a report from Verizon that was published in 2014. That's over 100 pages as well. So, and obviously, social media. It seems all over onto an email and web. And also, uh, there is some things to talk about for um, preparedness checklists. So what to do before um, a cyber attack or, um, or an intrusion. Again, that will help you in your planning guide. I'm going to have to read all of these for you. <clears throat> you know, again, con you know, um, contact someone from legal department, human resource, look at your personnel policies. Because um, a lot of it does come within, I hate to say. And then what to do during a cyber attack. When you purchase the insurance, normally you call your agent, you call 800 number, they're gonna get you to the right place to start working on this. But what people don't realize, there is notice periods. So you only have within between, some of these endorsements I saw, between 10 to 60 days to make a claim. After that, there may not be coverage. So again, with Brett making examples, you didn't know your backup was being backed up. And what if that was, you know, longer. So um, I'm not going to say there's not a great area for insurance, but you know, obviously if you're looking for a loophole of not to get paid for something because you weren't aware of things, just read your contracts. Um, I tend to go over my exclusions with my clients more than the coverages because they're, those pages are getting bigger and bigger on your policies. And then what do you do after um, one share to do? Obviously, credit monitoring is a, is a big thing, making sure your clients feel more secure working with your business. <coughs> so I know mine was done. So I want to thank phase two, working with Brett, and get this information out to you, working with um, Bill and Sharon, the chamber, and obviously Rob and her team over at the Calvert Library. So I guess now we'll take some questions. So we have a little Q&A, and then I have a survey um, at the end like you participated. I do have a question for you. Yes. Um, how do you find out uh, we we actually rent software to run our business uh, out of a company in New Jersey. I guess you got to read their terms and conditions as yeah. to breaches and stuff. Yes. Or? Every company should have a big professional liability. Okay, yeah. I have errors and errors and emissions coverage. So you want to make sure they have it as well. But like Brett was saying, if there's, it depends on where the attack came from. Is it something they did, or is it something that your employers may have did? It's really hard to pinpoint where that right. breach came from. That's why you have the forensics team to determine that. Anywhere you can get on the internet, if you I have more info, you can get on. Exactly, exactly, so. yeah. But again, you're just, there's always, insurance is always gonna subrogate. Who's really at fault? Is it the IT people? Is it you right. guys? And obviously, which policy is going to pay? <laughs> That's a big thing. So I, I tend to think I always want more coverage for myself because I know what I can control. Um, you know, I get certificates of insurance all the time for people, just like your auto accident. You get to an auto accident, you, they give you an, an ID card. That doesn't mean they may have not paid their bill. There may be excluded driver. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of factors. So I tell myself, you know, protect your business. Don't assume someone else is covering it for you. Paying a lot. That's why I wonder. There you go, I know, yeah. What is your uh, percentage of your commercial clients that have cyber insurance? Not much. Not, not many. Yeah. Now, um, 
it's you know it's coming like you said it's, it's certain endorsement nationwide gives i didn't identity theft coverage we just were able to offer it last november so that's the only time i've been able to offer it another broker company that i'm able i just got coverage in february so um just to show you i don't know who has it um I, like, so it's nationwide you have identity theft for the owners of the corporation but when your customers information your donors information there's no coverage for that that needs to be endorsed hmm. no i'm just um i'm working with with several companies as a business partner. and it occurs to me that on top of because they do Particularly, one has by DO2 regs has to have everything mm -hmm. their health, their licensing, everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we just call and get find out if, they, if they're so we already have our government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do we just call and ask? Do All of it, if they, yeah, I mean, I think it's. The thing about insurance, you know, you have to be appointed with different carriers. I mean, you just can't, you know, just call travelers. You have to work with the broker. Right. Um, so just find out if the current policy you have, if you can endorse it. You know, it's all easier to endorse it a whole new policy. But actually, in your packets, um, in the bags I gave you, there is a white, white folder. And um, I actually gave you guys a little checklist on your business insurance. Mm -hmm. Some little tips on, you know, do you have some good things planned for you? Then I have, I got these from the Federal Trade Commission. So this is just some good things I did. This is from 2013. I wasn't able to get any more in, in the time frame, but they have some good resources here for you. And then um, companies I represent have the coverages on here for you. So you can see here, like with Nationwide, you have data compromise, identity recovery, cyber one. And then my broker company has uh, different names, core cyber. So it's just pretty much, you know you're gonna need help. So you could just call an 800 number, tell them what's happening, they take care of the rest. That's what you pay the money for. Okay. So we just switch IT companies to with the new login, you know, they can call them, we have a problem, but we'll all of a sudden they're on our computer. Oh yeah, you know, shadowing. Fix, fix whatever is mm -hmm. happening. So now that we've gotten rid of the old company and we the new company, what should get back from the old company? I mean, they could probably, I mean, they probably still have some record of our passwords and so our our typical policy when we uh, take over a new IT client, our typical policy when we take over a new IT client is to uh, first request all documentation from the existing companies so we get copies of everything that they have, and we schedule a transition day. Uh, during that day, all of the administrative passwords get changed. Uh, we obviously notify the client what the passwords are going to be. We reset the passwords. We cut all of their existing remote access to the systems, uh, basically all at once. So I had requested, you know, anything that we could turn over, I still haven't seen anything. <laughs> In the event that is disgruntled, it falls on, you know, disgruntled handoff, it kind of falls on the new IT company to gather information at that point. There's, if they come in, it takes some time to explore it, they can find what they uh, The biggest thing is just to get the existing password so they have that. You can change it from there. Um, and then copies of licenses that you may own that maybe you want to create. We pretty much had all of it now, okay. so it was a smooth transition. That's good. I guess my concern is, and I don't think this would happen here, it's but if they had local businesses, you know, um, yeah. just them logging in or doing something they shouldn't be doing. Best practice is that your account should be suspended on your system. Typically, they'll have a login that they've created and all administrative passwords should be changed. So that, that means beyond the server, the computers too, but on the network equipment as well, and you host the solutions you have. Which is fascinating to me. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So we're going to be talking about um, what you 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> makes that recommendation is every 90 days, uh, every three months essentially. Um, there are different compliance standards, so medical is best rule of thumb is every 90 days for medical. Um, that's typically what I would advise as well, so every, every 90 days, and then also implement a policy that says it cannot be anything past five passwords. I'm so that's the pain. Yeah, it is. I know. It's a bunch of passwords nowadays, yeah. <laughs> Capital, a symbol. What's that? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Calvin? Do you have any recommendations for like, password keepers if you're going for very complex? Um, so we won't have heard of them. It's a pretty nice system. That's what we actually utilize for uh, password management. Uh, it has two factor authentication. It's all of those things. security measures for the clients and things like that. So who wants them? Zoho. Zoho. Uh, it's free for an individual user. If you want to share it with a company, you can do shared passwords or something for that. So you work across devices? Like if I'm there's an iPhone app for it. There's, uh, I believe there's an Android app. Yeah, there's an Android app as well. And of course, there's an Android app. So you would suggest that you do something like that? For your sanity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, I mean, for our example, we have over 1,200 passwords. Oh. Which there's so much client executive like, working into so it's we'll eventually have the ability to memorize a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, you utilize a lot of those resources to have, especially if you log in on multiple different systems that don't synchronize the password. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Me too, don't feel bad. I know. This form was dropped over a year. Yeah. <laughs> there are no security updates for it, there's no patches for it. Um, I did see that you said that you have a password manager that you have access to. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's one. Can they convert that to Windows 10 or something? Okay. There's no clean upgrade path for Windows XP to 7. You have to generally reinstall, uh, but it's pretty easy to upgrade that as well. Windows 10 is that as well. It's free right well, now. Well, what do you think of Windows 10? Caveat on that, it's free, but for technically a year. it's free for a year okay. and technically only for home users, not for businesses. Oh, is that right? Okay. If it detects that it's part of the domain network, it actually won't give you that for five months. I'm sorry, what were you doing? Oh, I just wondered. Some people really like one. Look, I don't know which one. There was one that I had friends who were so furious with it, they uninstalled it. And uh, their old one back. 8.0 Vista. 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 Vista 8 and 8.1 weren't well received, so a lot of people help out for that. Uh, Windows 10 feedback has been pretty positive so far. Uh, we've been utilizing that for supporting the analysis. I have a, for you, Mr. Lee, what is the best um, software would not work with another model, so we were forced to switch over, which I'm glad we did because of the support, but there is a lot of software that will not work with speed anymore. So it's really kind of worth it to make the, make the change. Okay. <laughs> it's not too bad. Well, yeah. if you're non-profit, you go to Texas and get for a really cheap. Right. Well, it's true. We didn't have our money. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. 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 Thank